Hi folks, I'm your instructor Tom Affolter. Welcome back to my C-Sharp series. Today I want to chat with you briefly about one of the main concepts in object-oriented programming, which is inheritance. Although the terminology will often mislead you, it's overly geeky, inheritance is one of those topics that simplifies programming the object-oriented programming world tremendously. It takes complex topics and converts them into individual components or controls or classes, if you will. Inheritance works off that concept of write it once and then reuse it, reuse it, reuse it. Now before I get started, I want to make sure that you're ready to discuss inheritance. So some basic things that you should know. First of all, I would expect you to have a basic understanding of the object-oriented principles. You haven't had to apply them yet necessarily, but you do understand what a class is, what a property is, what an object is, and we'll review some of those topics here in just a moment. I would expect that you be able to code in basic C Sharp and understand how to use Visual Studio. The version of Visual Studio is not crucial. The demonstration I'm going to be giving will be on Visual Studio 2017, but I could take the same example and go back to Visual Studio 2008 and still, still reproduce what I'm creating. I would also expect you to have an understanding and be able to develop void and returning value methods or functions. So you need to understand how to pass parameters to a method. You need to understand how to get values back from a method, if you will, and you need to understand what a void or a do-it method is. Then I would expect you to be able to develop a basic business object class. A business object class is a class with a combination of maybe properties and definitely some methods built into it that are public, and it has constructors that you can pass information to or from. And then I would expect you to also understand the concept of what modifiers are. We have two basic modifiers that we're going to focus on in development of object-oriented programming. There are more, but we're going to focus primarily on the public and the private. Public meaning you have outside access to that property or method. Private saying that you have only access within that control itself. And again, we'll go back and review that in just a moment. Now, although it's not essential, I do recommend that you have a little bit of basic understanding of Windows Forms or Windows Presentation Foundation at WPF Development, just to understand one of the demonstrations I'm going to be giving you here in a moment. Now, if any of these topics don't make sense to you, I suggest you go back in and look at my YouTube videos, and you'll find each one of these topics are covered in one of the videos that I have out there. So what are the objectives of this tutorial? Well, the first thing we obviously have to understand is what is inheritance and why do we want to use it. And then I'm going to follow that up with some terminology that we need to know. It's really terminology we've already covered, but I want to go back and review it because this is a good time for that and it's going to prepare us for some of the stuff that we're going to talk about within our demonstration. But the vast majority of this lecture is going to be demonstration. First thing I'd like to do is go back in and talk about creating a basic class. Some of that should be review. In this case, we're going to create a pet class. But in my next example after that, we're going to subclass that. We'll talk about the term subclass in a minute. We're going to create from that pet class a dog class and show the advantages of subclassing and how it can save us code. And then I'm going to take it to a real world approach. My example three, we're going to go back in and we're going to grab a Windows control. I'm going to subclass that Windows control. This will be a really cool demonstration. And I'm going to be able to take that Windows control, add it back to my toolbar, and at that point in time, use that control over and over again in my application. So let's go ahead and get started. Although I focus on C Sharp, virtually all object-oriented programming languages perform the same or similar tasks in this demo. What we do here, with the exception of the Windows demonstration, can be done in Java, for example. The time that you take to learn and use what object-oriented programming has to offer will make you a much better programmer no matter what the language is. Inheritance refers to the passing of features from a class to an object or from a class to another class. These features include front door access to that class via things like properties or methods or constructors, things we should have already covered. At the same time, private features are inherited that are accessed by public features. We'll talk about that in just a moment. When I instantiate a media control, for example, onto a form and I play the play method, I'm almost assured that all the code that renders the ones and zeros to audio and video is not bunched up in that single play method. More than likely, the public play method will call other 
private methods to do the work. These are methods the original designer hid or made private because we don't need to access them to play a video or an audio file. So let's try a little bit more worldly example. Imagine you have a meat market and you sell sausage. The public has access to what you choose to make public to the customer, namely a cooler with the sausage and those packaged sausage together. You offer the customer the view of the sausage and the prices, but that's not what makes sausage sausage. There are many aspects of that sausage you hide from the customer, things that they don't need to see, like slaughtering of the pig, grinding the meat up and packaging, the gross stuff. Customers don't need to see those steps, nor do you want them to see those. But to operate the market, all those steps are essential. So you show the customer only what you need to show them to purchase the meats. In programming, if we design classes, we let the user or the programmer see only those aspects they absolutely need. We hide our intellectual knowledge. We hide that with private methods. The ones that we choose to make available to the user, like the play method I talked about a moment ago, those are public. Or if we were talking about the meat market, the prices that are available, the ability to purchase that sausage, that would be public. But we hide again those aspects the user doesn't need to see. When you declare a variable, for example, in an application right now, that variable is automatically private. It's assumed private. You can put the word private in front of it, like private int my int, but you don't have to put the word private in it. Under most situations, you don't make variables public. That's not the way that you communicate to a class. You would typically pass information to and from classes with one or more uses of either properties, constructors, or methods. Now, although I've thrown some terms at you already, let's go back and just review the terms a little bit that we should already know. A class is the most basic element of any object-oriented program. In the C family of languages, you have an opening class command, the name of the class, in this case pet, an opening bracket, and then a closing bracket. All definitions of the class are defined between the opening and closing brackets. In the brackets, we can add variables, constructors, properties, and methods. The classes themselves are always defined as public. What good is a class if we can't get to it itself? So here's an example of a console application. All C-sharp applications and most C-family applications have a main method somewhere. This includes Windows Form applications as well. It includes websites as well. That's the main startup method. Whenever you execute a C-sharp program, again, being a Windows Form or a console application, it automatically looks for that main. And when it finds main, that's the first thing it executes. In a Windows Form, we don't always focus on that because main automatically executes Form 1 or that default form that comes up. We only have to go to main if we want to change that a little bit. Now, although we haven't covered it in this course or any of my previous courses, a static method is one that does not need to be instantiated to use. Now watch for a module I'm working on to come out pretty soon covering static classes and methods. It's not in the focus of this lecture right now, but it is a very important topic. Notice in the console application the string array parameter being passed to the array as a variable called args. This is an optional feature that lets you pass values to main. That too is not in the scope of this class, but I'll bet you if you sit down and you think about it, you can understand the value. When you're dealing with a console application, you're typically writing a program that you can use basically at the DOS prompt. So what that allows you to do is put the command, the name of your program in, and then pass it value. No parameters or as many as you want. You could use that array that's passed back to parse those values out and do something with it. Again, it's not something we're doing in the class, but I thought it would be a good moment to explain to you. The point is not to dwell on the main, but to show you the console application is a class on of its own. Just like in this slide, you see Windows Form application also has a class opening tag and a closing and everything goes in between it. In fact, every Microsoft tool that you use that creates an application, including ASP.NET, uses an opening and a closing class tag. Again, a class is the most basic element of the object-oriented program. When you run an object-oriented program, you're manipulating objects. Classes are abstract. 
they're the design. You don't run a class. You take a class, you convert it into an object, and then you run the object. That's what compilation is all about. So when a program runs, all classes are instantiated into objects. When you change properties at runtime, you're manipulating objects. When you change properties of a class during design, you're defining the startup property settings when that object is initially instantiated. Design time properties versus runtime properties. Design time properties modify the class before it's instantiated. Runtime properties modify the object as it's running after it's been instantiated. So here's an example of how I would instantiate a pet class into a my pet object I can manipulate. By looking at this code, I can see a property named name I'm going to assign FIDO to. For me to be able to see name, it must have been declared public. You can only see public features in IntelliSense. For that matter, you can only access public features, period, not just with IntelliSense. One method we use to communicate with an object or a class is via properties. Here's an example of a property I've called name. Although you can use shortcut getters and setters for PODs, this method is recommended for any other object. POD properties have no field or helper variables. They really have nothing at all to protect. In this example, I communicate through my getters and setters to the pet object. Although data is passed in and retrieved through the name property, all the internal work would be done through the M name private helper or also called field variable. Remember, look at the properties accessed from a user's perspective the programmer that's using your tool. Getters get the value for the user, whereas setters pass the value to a property. You can make a property read-only by excluding a setter. Because you have to see properties outside the class, you're going to always define a property as public. It's also very important to understand the use of methods as we've talked about past in this course. We have two different types of methods that we're going to be talking about. We have value returning methods and we have void methods. Void methods are called procedures. Value returning methods are typically called functions. Here's an example of a void method called postName. Notice in this example that I'm passing in two different arguments, first name and last name. They have to be passed in for this method here to operate. It returns absolutely no value. It's a do it method. His whole responsibility is to run this simple chunk of code. Well, you find these void methods very commonly as repetitive code. If you've got a chunk of code, maybe 10 lines, for example, that you repeat over and over in your program, why do you want to put it five or six different places in your program? You put it in a void method, and you call that void method whenever you need it. That way, if you have an error or you want to do an addition, you've got one place to go in that void method, as opposed to having to go back in and change it in those five or 10 different locations that we had before. The other type of method that we have is a function. And a function basically, if you will, is a user-defined command. It lets me go back in and perform some kind of activity and return a value back. In this particular case, it's using get days old. Get days old is a integer function. It acts just like an integer when a value is returned. It's going to treat it as though it's an integer. In this particular case, I'm taking date time dot today. That's going to be today's date. And I'm subtracting from that some class level variable. It must be a class level variable because it's not defined in this method, which is the birth date of that individual. And I'm trying to get the number of days back from that. Again, called days old. The return value that we have here has to match the signature value. The signature value here tells me that it's an integer. That means that what I'm returning better be an integer. If it's not, I'm going to get a casting error. The other thing that you have to be familiar with as well is understanding the concept of overloading. And what is overloading? Overloading is the ability to go back in and create multiple methods with the same method name. But really what makes a method is not the method name, it's the method signature. It's a combination of all of these elements, void or the return type, the name of the method itself, the number, and the type of parameters that are being used. So in the slide here we're looking at, I've got addNum. 
And add nums, as we take a look at, there's two different methods. One, the top one, accepts three arguments. The bottom one accepts two. So when you run your program, how does it know which one of these to run? It knows because when you write out your add num, if you pass three arguments, it's going to run the first one. If you pass two, it's going to run the second. That's what's going to pop up in IntelliSense. Let's review constructors again. Although they appear to be a method, a constructor really is an element of a class. It's a component. When you instantiate a class, you reference a constructor whether one exists or not. If it exists, it's executed. So in this example, we have pet my pet equals new pet. We're instantiating a pet object called my pet. The parentheses at the end reference the constructor. What we find out is whether there is or isn't a constructor, you still have to put those parentheses at the end. If there is no constructor or if the constructor is empty, they act the same exact way. If a constructor exists, it automatically executes when the object's instantiated. This is the self-starting method that you use oftentimes to set up initial values, to pass values, and there's a variety of things that you can use a constructor for. A constructor has the same name exactly as the class. In this case, you'll notice that my constructor is named pet, but also if you look above, the class is also named pet. That's what defines a constructor. The other thing that you're going to notice about a constructor is it has no return data type. A constructor is always going to be a void method. It doesn't return anything at all, so you don't have to put void in on it. That's where it differs a little bit from a standard method. We've already touched a couple of times on modifiers. There's two types of modifiers that we're going to deal with in classes. And the class itself deals with modifiers. Those are public and private. Anything public can be seen on the outside. Anything private cannot be seen on the outside. So the first thing that comes to mind oftentimes is why would you ever want to have a private method on the inside? And the reason is that that's where you're going to hide all your work. Typically, the public methods are there just to communicate back and forth, whereas the private methods physically do the work. You hide stuff between the private methods. An example we've looked at before is the media player. That media player has a play method in it, but I will guarantee you that if you went behind that play method, you are not going to find all the code it takes for ones and zeros to be converted into audio or video. What you're going to find most likely, and again, they've hidden that from us, is that that public play method calls other methods that exist out there and those other methods it's calling are private. So public methods are accessible outside the class, private methods are not. You don't even know a private method exists unless you have the original code for that respective class. Next thing we want to talk about is that concept of inheritance. And that's what this is all about. Inheritance is that core feature of object-oriented programming. Inheritance says that any object will inherit the methods and properties of the parent class. Now the parent class is the originating class. A parent has a child, so the original class would be the parent, and the classes that we create out of that will have different names uh, just depending. Sometimes we call it a child class, sometimes that we call that a subclass. In addition, the parent class can also be called the base class. So these are the geeky terms that you have to be aware of, whether I'm using the term parent class or child class or base class or subclass, which is the process of converting a parent class into a child class. Now, you only subclass a child if you want to make changes. There's absolutely no reason to subclass a class and not make changes to it why wouldn't you use the original class? You subclass to do a variety of things. You subclass to add new features, that's called extending. Or you subclass to remove previous features or to hide them. I could subclass that media player if I wanted to and override or hide the play method, which would kind of be ridiculous, but I could do that. The last thing that we're going to take a look at as far as review goes is that, that geeky term encapsulization. And it's really simple. It sounds geeky, but what encapsulation says is you are what you're made up of. Or in a case of an object or a class, a class is composed of all the elements, public and private, properties, variables, and methods. The entire object is only object if it's encapsulated with everything it needs in order to function public and private. 